the Christian meaning of enlightenment, as I was asked to talk about, has defined enlightenment in such a, a very, very individualistic, tiny uh, way that really offered little gift to the world. I don't know all the historical reasons for that. My guess is, and that's all I can say, is that both, both in Eastern Orthodoxy uh, and in Roman Catholicism, we aligned ourselves with empire. And, and uh, once you align the message of a spiritual teacher with imperial thinking, there's a whole bunch of questions you can't ask anymore. Uh, and you can only see what you're told to look for. And if you weren't told to look for it, you, you can't see it. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, uh, attended any of Brian McLaren's workshops, and maybe some of you have also seen this video where uh, he tells one side of the room to observe uh, how many times the people dressed in black throw the ball to the people dressed in white. And he says, this side of the room, you count how many times the people dressed in white throw it to the... So you're just intent on winning, because, you know, I want to get the right number. And uh, after we've all counted and, and seen the, oh, maybe it's a two-minute video, uh, he asks, and it's amazing how many people still get the, the number wrong, but then he says, how many of you noted that during this passing of the ball back and forth, uh, a gorilla walked across the scene? <laughs> and honestly, in a group much bigger than this, he did it at one of our conferences in Albuquerque, uh, it wasn't more than 2% of the people noted a gorilla. He shows it again, and it's quite obvious. Every, how did I not see? Because we were focusing on one thing, we really did not see. Our eyes did not see something else. Well, I think once the gospel of Jesus got aligned with the Roman Empire in the West, with Byzantium in the East, uh, there were a whole bunch of gorillas we just didn't see, you know? <laughs> Uh, it was all uh, individual soul salvation. And that's the word, pretty much, that came to substitute for, for uh, Jesus' clear talking. If you want to carry through the metaphor of enlightenment, it, it's rather clear, especially in John's gospel. But we didn't ask about enlightenment, uh, even for the individual, much less for the corporate. Huh? Uh, what, what we settle for were what I call belief systems and belonging systems. Right? We, we, when you want to unite people, which is what empire wants, you want everybody to be conformed into one worldview, you really are threatened by any notion of, of inner freedom or, or inner awareness or consciousness you, you would rather, to be perfectly honest, have people unconscious. <laughs> and so you settle for belonging systems. And we look at most of the wars of, of Europe uh, and Christian nations, and they've all been between groups that both consider themselves Christian. <laughs> but you could see that uh, the Christianity was identified, if at all, with their nationhood, with their rights as a people, or their, their image as a people, and continuing into the First World War, and, and in some ways even the Second, that uh, the group you belonged to, the group you fought for, was your identity. <laughs> that was your personhood. And uh, even the church, the churches, were largely content with this, uh, we were more Italian or German or French or Spanish than we were Catholic, even though the word Catholic means universal. We, we clearly never got it. Huh? Uh, it was much more our identification with the group. So let me just, so you don't think I'm just making this up. Uh, let's, let's go back to Jesus. He still is the founder of the firm of Western Christianity, you know, uh, even though you wouldn't think it. And, and I, I have to say this not in any sense an anti-Protestant statement, 
But in, in most ways, Protestantism did not reform Catholicism in these regards. It was asking the same narrow questions and tied into the same European uh, imperial worldview in, in most cases. Jesus, to use the metaphor of light, calls himself in John's gospel, my word is the true light that enlightens all peoples. In John 8, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light too. And what he says of himself, this is not usually pointed out to Christians, it seems to me. He, in John 8, he does say, I am the light of the world. But in Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. I don't know why we teachers never pointed that out. Uh, you know, we exalt Jesus, but always feel to exalt Jesus, we got to negate humanity, which is, we, that's what religion does. Religion is always looking for one absolute, one highly exalted absolute, because that tends to hold the group together. Uh, but we don't want to say what Jesus said in John 5, 14, you are the light of the world too. I've never heard a preacher in all my years in the church uh, uh, connect those two phrases and show that, that they in some ways contradict one another or not contradict, actually complement. Now, uh, in Matthew 6, here's where he's really moving in the direction that uh, we would now call either shadow work or... or uh, a capacity to have a different set of eyes. And now enlightenment is something I participate in. Let me try Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is diseased, your whole body, in fact, will be filled with darkness. In fact, if your inner lamp is, in fact, darkness what darkness there will be. So, I mean, this could be straight Buddhist teaching. How you see is what you see. And it's all about cleaning the lens. And if you don't clean the lens, I see this in teaching contemplation. Most people do not see things as they are. They see things as they are. And we, do, we have not given uh, Western civilization, this kind of wisdom. We just haven't. It's, you, you could remain terribly, terribly narcissistic, greedy, vain, egocentric, but just believe the doctrines of the church. Uh, and this was all the way to the top. You know, you, you didn't demand transformation. So when you emphasize belief systems and belonging, belief systems, by the way, ask almost nothing of you. Right, it's really no skin off your back to say I believe Jesus is the Son of God. You know, I believe if you're evangelical, the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. Huh? Or if you're Catholic, I believe that Mary was always a virgin. Great, you know. I <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> so what? It has so we really created fast food religion. It really did. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and you felt you were some high-minded, transformed person because you believed doctrines. And again, Protestantism did not reform Catholicism. It just changed the belief systems and the emphasis. We're going to emphasize this instead of that. Belonging systems, well, we talked about that. So what, what loses out when you emphasize belief systems and belonging systems is transformational systems. <laughs> Is this really changing perception? Now, I have to say, one of the wonderful things the Franciscans gave me, we had to study four years of philosophy before they put the scriptures in our hand. And I think that is what kept a lot of us from going fundamentalist. And we always feel sorry for the denominations that where, where you, you give young preachers the word of God. You know, you inflate the young ego with I have the ultimate power, but he doesn't know how to think yet. And I'm not trying to make this overly rational, because we know that's been much of the problem too. But the very first course I took in 1962 at four years of philosophy was a, a, a course, some of you probably 
took it to a terribly ugly word. It's called epistemology, you know? <laughs> and epistemology is how do you know what you think you know? <laughs> We've been hearing about this all, really. The East emphasized epistemology. How do you know what you know? What is consciousness? You know? How do you become aware? We went through all the different theories of knowledge and so forth. But in fact, in, in the real common order of Western Christianity, uh, it was a, a small percentage that studied epistemology. Mostly you just dove into metaphysics. In other words, not how do you know what you know, but what is the truth? <laughs> And this running to people, usually young people, when they began their studies, into this lust for certitude, this lust for metaphysical explanation without much observation. <laughs> observation was not encouraged. Uh, it was giving people answers before they even largely asked the question. Hmm? We... <laughs> We American Catholics grew up on a terrible little book called the Baltimore Catechism. I'm sure some of you had it forced on you, too. And we now find out, you know, this was written by some Monsignor from New Jersey, nothing against Monsignors from New Jersey, but he had, he had no major degree in theology, you know. A catechism a whole, is a whole system of question and answer, question and answer. Uh, I love to point out, I still have my dog-eared copy that I often refer to, if you go back, any of you who might have it, uh, your Baltimore Catechism, question 16 is this. Question 16 is, where is God? And in fact, I'm going to find out who the true Catholics are in this room. I'm going <laughs> to ask the question. We had to memorize it. You know, it was all memorized, you know. And you all know the answer. Where is God? No, God is everywhere. You're not good Catholics, all right? <laughs> the, que the answer is God is everywhere. Really, that's pretty good. The, the Monsignor from New Jersey was not all bad. <laughs> but in fact, he, he lost it right after question 16. <laughs> the other 326 questions and answers in the Baltimore Catechism really go out of their way to say, well, we didn't really mean that. God really isn't everywhere. God's only in the Roman Catholic Church, so all the rest are heretics, you know. And he's really only in the bread, in the tabernacle, which is locked up uh, in the church, and only if the priest was in good standing when he celebrated Mass. So you see what you end up with. God is hardly anywhere. I got to... <laughs> and we priests control it. We control it. We got the key to the tabernacle as we... <laughs> Uh, and these were all well-intentioned, sincere, good people. Many of them had a better heart than I do, but were just given very, very limited worldviews, you know. And this is the temptation of all religion, that we decide where the sacred is and where the sacred is not. That's what it comes down to. And once you're in control of that, you're in control. <laughs> you're, I mean, this, is, this has been priesthood in every civilization since the beginning of time deciding what is sacred and what is not sacred by purity codes and can't touch this, can't eat that. Uh, it's all divvying up the world. Well, I'm afraid we did the same with, with our whole understanding or our lack of understanding of enlightenment. Huh? So to get back to the theme, what, what happened was that the word salvation, which is used, a lot in the New Testament, sort of started substituting for enlightenment, all right? And the worst piece of that is that it was all pushed off into the next world. At that point, you have no transformational religion anymore. It's all, I'm going to use a cynical phrase, but you'll understand, it's all fire insurance, huh? <laughs> and, and really... <laughs> And religion is paying your fire insurance dues, you know, <laughs> or whatever they might be. Uh, and, and if God, if God really, and I do know some of the metaphors in the New Testament lend themselves to this, you know, 
But if God really is an eternal torturer, I want you to feel that, <laughs> eternal torturer <laughs> to anybody who doesn't like him or her, why would you create mystics? I mean, to put it this way, <laughs> if on your first date, your girlfriend said, if you don't date me again, I will burn you for all eternity. <laughs> Would, would any of you go on a second date with this? <laughs> you've got, uh, no, you got to know. That's what we're dealing with. This, I'm making it uh, uh, facetious, but it isn't facetious. I've been a priest 42 years and have done enough spiritual direction and confession to realize, my God, this is their real active image of the divine is not allurement or safety or intimacy or enticement. Uh, it's threat. This won't work. This will not work. Uh, this is, I mean, thank God you left the monastery, Maurizio. It's, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that no one got it because I've traveled enough now to enough countries, cultures, religions, inside of every monastery, diocese, school, parish, church, there's always a few enlightened people. There always are, <laughs> against all the odds. <laughs> there's a few people who just flow with love. You've met them huh? in every religion, in every group. And you say, what did they do right? How did they get it with all the horrible theology that we gave people, you know? But back to the notice, notion of, of salvation. You see, once you have an imperial religion, which is what happened after 313 and Constantine and his friends made us into the established religion of the empire. Hmm? You have to have, as I said, conformity, agreement. You want to have one God figure. That holds a nation together. We've, we've seen that in all of history. It, it works very effectively. But most especially, we Christians had to prove and demand that you believe that Jesus is God, right? Because he became the effective God figure. Huh? It was not really Trinitarian mystical theology anymore. It was very much Jesus. Was, you look at the front of the, most of European cathedrals, Jesus sitting on a throne like a judge. It's not the meek, humble Jesus that we know anymore. He's operating as a judge and a king who holds together Western civilization. But once you've got to prove that Jesus is God, then all of the, and almost half of the gospel stories are healing stories. Uh, read transformation. <laughs> you know, uh, but we couldn't hear them as transformational stories where Every symbol of the person and the response afterwards is a transformed response. Huh? It's not just medical cures of what's happening in the body. It's clear something is happening in the spirit. But we had to use all of the healing stories in the four Gospels, and there's a lot of them, to say, wow, Jesus works miracles. See, Jesus is God. Now, there's a leap there, of course, <laughs> But that's what the miracle, the healing stories became. And very often at the end of these healing stories, Jesus will use phrases like, your faith has saved you, your faith has made you whole, go in peace, you're there, you're okay. It's clear that this salvation he's talking about is present tense. He's not uh, saving someone from the hellfires later. Do you understand? It's clear. Once I, I tell you this, you go back to the gospel and you say, how did anybody ever miss the point? He, he's not talking about a reward punishment system later, right? He's talking about transformation now, enlightenment now. But we weren't told to look for that, so we didn't see it. We really didn't see it. We were just supposed to say, wow, Jesus can do it. Jesus is the real God. Right? Jesus is the true God. Wow, theology doesn't transform people. <laughs> it just inflates them. Right? It just makes them think they're far more along the path than they really are. Huh? Thinking because they're riding on the coattails of the true God who can work miracles, then that must mean I'm transformed too. And we all know. 
that has not been the case. No? So we, we just largely missed it. Now, in all fairness, if you take in the four Gospels, in all the letters of Paul and the other letters, every time the word salvation is used, uh, about one-third of them seem to be saying salvation, enlightenment, I'm using them almost synonymously, uh, is something that has already happened. It's an objective accomplishment. You are saved, right? Uh, and that's where most of the mystics lean. Uh, this is not something you achieve, you accomplish by any performance principle whatsoever. You are inherently children of God. You, uh, you are recipients of the divine indwelling. Your DNA is divine. Use whatever language you're comfortable with. But uh, that third of the text clearly lost out, except in the first centuries, the patristic period. We'll come back to that in a minute. And especially in Eastern Orthodoxy. And I, I suppose there's reasons for that. I'm not sure. One third of the, the texts which talk about salvation or being saved talk about something actively happening now. So it has happened. It is happening. You are in the process of being saved. And one third of them, in all fairness do say salvation is yet to come, right? But you put them all together, and that's the only way you can read the Bible. If you want to, you know, you can prove anything you want from a line of the Bible. Just pick and choose. <coughs> and they, <coughs> many of them contradict one another clearly. I don't know how people can't see that. <coughs> um, but uh, it's interesting that we, by and large, Catholic and Protestant, chose the last third, those that said it was coming later, all right? And almost entirely ignored, certainly the first third of the statements. Uh, did, was there some self-interest involved in that? You know, as a clergyman, I'm quite aware of what, although my father Francis didn't let us go in this direction, but, but uh, that, you know, clergy can be a career state, you understand? And after a while, it becomes job security. You want them to keep coming back. I mean, they're putting the collection, you understand? It, it's paying your bills. And so if you keep the message sort of like a carrot on a stick out in front of them, all right, a few more masses on Sunday, a few more commandments to obey, maybe someday on your deathbed uh, you'll, you'll be saved. That has been our underlying bias, not to teach prayer if I can just use that word, which I think is an alternative processing system, uh, a system that demands enlightenment, we have a bias against teaching contemplation, in my experience, huh? because then you find inner authority, and I mean inner authority in a very healthy, solid, beautiful way, but to the degree we give you inner authority, of course, what happens? You don't rely as much upon the outer authority. Huh? And if you want to hold the, the whole system together by outer authority, to obey the Pope, obey the priests, obey the, the Bible, you don't want to lead people to a high degree of inner awareness. Now, in all of, I, I, I don't think that was done maliciously. I really don't. Most of them taught what they were taught. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> You know, I, I look at the Catholic Church in particular uh, to an outsider. It certainly must look like a monolithic, you know, pyramid, pope and cardinals and archbishops. It certainly is hierarchy. But for those of us inside, of course, we, we're so aware, I in particular, that there's all these satellites around the edge of the pyramid called nuns and Franciscans and Benedictines and Carmelites. And we... We hardly pay attention to. <laughs> I think that probably shocks a, a bona fide Catholic, you know, how little we pay attention to the pyramid. I mean, it's just, it's often an embarrassment, you know. We just, <laughs> but we found a way to do what we had to do. When you're a Franciscan, our ideals are, are the gospel and the following of, of Jesus in the way our Father Francis did. It's not about the pope and the priests and the bishops. Do you understand? 
In fact, uh, I became a priest, really, because they asked me to, but we, Francis didn't even want us to be priests because he knew once you're a priest, you've got to speak the party line. He got to, and I don't, again, mean that in a terribly malicious way. It's the nature of institution, any, any institution. Huh? If you're going to speak for it and protect it, you've got to speak for it. We've seen what trouble this has gotten us into in the scandals in the last 20 years. But at any rate, we, we didn't, by and large, teach people what, for the Carmelites, the Franciscans, uh, is the heart of the message, which is to, learn, to develop an inner life uh -huh. and to balance all this externalization with all this form with some emptiness, all right? I mean, John of the Cross and the early Franciscans, almost the only message is letting go, detachment, uh, you know, uh, detaching from this world of form and realizing that it's all passing away. It sounds, again, amazingly like the Buddha. So uh, I did mention that, that it held on probably better than anywhere else uh, in, in the Eastern mystics, Eastern orthodoxy, which, of course, as Western churchmen, Catholic or Protestant, we didn't study them nearly as much, you know? Maximus the Confessor, Simeon the New Theologian, uh, the Cappadocian Fathers from Eastern Turkey. Now, they, to the man, and it was mostly men at that point, who at least were the teachers, because uh, they didn't allow women to be educated for the most part, they rather universally believed in a, a doctrine that was called theosis, T-H-E-O-S-I-S. -S, huh? Theosis is translated divinization, right? They had no doubt that what salvation was was the revelation to the soul, to the individual, of its divine nature. This is clear in the Eastern mystics and fathers of the church up till about the fourth century, you know, when again they get overtaken by the Eastern Empire and Byzantium. Once you start asking those questions, the questions of mysticism are largely marginalized into distant monasteries, hermits, a few people hold on to it, or as I said here earlier today, you almost have to be a hermit because you don't fit in the way the gospel is normally being taught in a Sunday church, which is much more keep them coming back, keep the carrots on the stick, out in front of them, don't really awaken the soul. Don't really give them a lot of self-knowledge, a, a lot of interiority, because that will undo the process. So the, uh, the doctrine of theosis, one of the phrases they use most often is from the second letter of Peter, the first chapter, he says, do you not know you are sharers in the divine nature? Now, now that, that's where it was put most directly. Once you get it, you can see that it's intimated, it's hoped for, it's half believed and longed for all throughout the scriptures. But it, it's almost too daring to believe it. You understand? It's, uh, it was called hubris or pride. We instead, with our dualistic minds, reminded humanity of its humanity and Jesus of his divinity. That's what the dualistic mind did to Western Christianity. It utterly split. You carried the human part, which reached really low points. You know, again, I'm not trying to be against any one of the particular reformers, but you know, some of the Swiss and the Scottish reformers... It, you begin with absolute damnation or, or inferiority. Or, uh, there's no positive anthropology whatsoever. You've got such a huge pit to dr dig out of, do you understand, uh, that most people just never got there. So the effect was this in general, and I'm, 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 I'm telescoping this in too little time, but you're going to get the gist of it, is we substituted morality for mysticism. Uh, that's what we did. And you can almost perfectly correlate. The more moralistic a Christian church is, the less 
it has encountered the mystical. It's very clear to me. You know, I, I, the Franciscans, we've never... <laughs> We've never been known as the moralists of the church. We're sort of considered lightweight, and you know we're always pictured as fat cookie jars and drinking, <laughs> uh, drinking beer and, and so forth. But in, in <laughs> our wine, if we're in your country, yeah. uh, and in great part it's true. I mean, not all of, <laughs> but in great uh, <laughs> in great part it's true that we're not real moralistic because we just had these magnificent beginnings with Francis and the early Italian Franciscans who, who just were utterly free and happy human beings, you know? And we so got inebriated with that, you know, that, that when you get the mystical first, the oneness we've been talking about here, you just don't uh, get preoccupied with this much morality will achieve you, this much... Uh, heaven, this much morality will make God love you more, this much morality will, will achieve your own superior state, whatever it might be. So moralism very much appeals to the ego, in my opinion. Huh? Even though we fail at it all the time, we like a contest that we can climb in. You know? Grace is always a humiliation for the ego. It really is. When it's just given. And it's given to those people on the street just as much as you. And you're not a bit better than they are. <laughs> and you're not a bit better than Hindus and Buddhists and Protestants. And, oh, we don't want to believe that. Do you understand? No group wants this, this great democratization of the message that, in fact, even the new physics, as we've heard this afternoon, is revealing to us. So what's happening now, as we're, we're reappreciating the mystical tradition, our inherent identity in God, the new seeing that proceeds from this inherent identity in God. Uh, and then uh, the, the nonviolent attitudes then that proceed from that. Uh, we're, we're calling theology, or some are calling theology right now, a turn toward participation. And I've heard that word used a lot here, beautifully so. That... The religion I grew up with, I was raised in Kansas, all right, was very much not religion as participation, it was religion as observation. You observed the theater of the mass. Uh, you observed the doctrines of the church as something to be intellectually assented to. But it wasn't an emphasis upon practices whereby you experienced it for yourself. And this is happening in all of our groups. The moving toward practices whereby you can experience your true state for yourself. Now, since I've been so critical of my own denomination and Christianity in general, I want to say that a lot of those have always been there, you know. I mean, I do know people that the what I call the theater of the mass was also a true sacramental encounter that led them to this experience, <laughs> I mean, the very phrase we use, to go to communion. That's what Catholics describe when they go to Mass. I went to communion. That's very good. <laughs> Do you understand? We keep feeding you who you are, and one day you get it. My God, I'm... <laughs> I mean, Augustine said that in the 4th century. He said, we feed you the body of Christ so you will know that you are what you eat. <laughs> that you... <laughs> You are the body of Christ. That's really good stuff, you know. So I want you to, please, don't, I'm not trying to be an iconoclast. There's, I have no time for that. It's a waste of time to be rebellious and oppositional. I, I just said those things to, to let you know how we did, in many ways, miss the point. But I don't think it was malicious. I don't think it was intentional. I think consciousness just wasn't ready. In many ways, why did it take till the last century for Gandhi and Martin Luther King to emerge on a, and to be understood on a broad scale? It seems me we just weren't ready for it. Huh? And, and that we didn't see, I was so glad when uh, Drew mentioned how, you know, the, the, uh, the corporate name of, of love is justice. Uh, I mean, that was said by Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus, but we just did, we weren't ready to, to get it. 
I mean, justice has not been high on our priority list up to now. I think of how uh, we brought Catholicism to, to Latin America. You know, they're Catholics from Mexico to Argentina. But you say, oh, my God, was there any notion of corporate justice? Was there any notion of compassion uh, when you see the, the immense poverty of all of these Catholic countries? So we're ready for it now. I think we're getting there uh, because uh, the, the, the way I can talk to you is the way I can talk to more and more people, and they don't fight me. The way they did even 40 years ago when I was first ordained, you know. Then uh, people wrote letters to the bishop, you know. <laughs> now maybe some of you will, but <laughs> I doubt it, I doubt it. But I hope I am answering the question of uh, the Christian meaning of enlightenment. I think it's there, it's very parallel and consistent with Awareness of who you are and how you see reality from this new ontological identity, who you are hidden with Christ in God, as Paul would say, and the behaviors that proceed from that new pair of eyes. But was it ever the mainline position in the normal Sunday churches? I'm sorry to say no, no. But we're getting there. So thank you for hearing. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah.